My name is Charles Henry Wheatley the third. The third. So I assume there was a second and a first. And a fourth. Is that right? Yeah, but no fifth. Two oh. granddaughters. All right. And you were born where, Charles? Baltimore, Maryland. And went to school at? Southern High School. And from Southern High School, you went to where? Western Maryland College. Had a boy. So did I. Yeah, I have to say, as I said earlier, that one of my greatest surprises when I heard that you were going to be my interviewer and uh, remembered our early days uh, 100 years ago, not quite 100, <laughs> about 50. Long time ago. Right. At Western Maryland College, you participated in a particular program that we're interested in today, and that was? ROTC. Right. And tell us a little about ROTC. Okay. I started in, well, when, at that time, um, Western Maryland had one of the oldest ROTC programs in the United States, if I recall. And it was an infantry program, which later became what the Army called branch immaterial, <laughs> which meant you could pick anything later. But when uh, I was there, it was uh, infantry. And uh, I took uh, that program for the first two years. And uh, at that time, uh, decided I'd go to graduate school. And I was looking at several possible careers, including the, the ministry, law, and teaching. And uh, so therefore, I did not sign up for advanced ROTC because my colleagues told me that that would not be a good idea because it would interrupt my graduate school career and that I would be deferred while I was in graduate school. So we didn't have to worry about the then draft uh, program. But uh, after I graduated in 1954, I, uh, I uh, studied one year in theology and philosophy at Drew University. Came back and uh, while I was doing that, had uh, four churches in Carroll County in Mount Airy called the Prospect Marvin Circuit and decided uh, that I would go to law school and decided at that time that I should start as quickly as possible. At the time, my wife and I were the first team teachers in Carroll County at the what was then Westminster Junior Senior High School, which is now East Middle School. And so uh, when, when I finished my teaching there, year there, I uh, signed up uh, for the University of Maryland Law School and began that my studies there, but came up with the idea that uh, since I, I, I was really, a, you, might, you might call one of those patriotic individuals, I, I was born about a mile from Fort McHenry and uh, the home of the Star Spangled Banner, as I often say, and I decided that deferments were not for me, even though I was entitled to one, so I went back and commuted daily from a morning class in law school to Westminster ROTC, taking the third and fourth year together and commuting from there to Washington, D.C., where I had been given a position as a doorkeeper in the House of Representatives while I was in law school. And uh, so I, they would then commute back to Baltimore in the evening and got permission to take day classes and night classes to get my full program. It was quite a busy schedule, as you can imagine. Sounds like it. <laughs> In fact, uh, well, some would say insanity. Yeah. Right? But uh, I was, a, my, I, my, the dean of the school said no one had ever done that, but if I was crazy enough to try it, he was crazy enough to allow me. So right. I, I did that for the year, and in 1957, uh, completed my ROTC, and uh, was uh, commissioned in the United States Army, and also uh, left in August of that year for officer basic training. I was originally scheduled to go to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, for the uh, artillery school, but my orders were changed to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, for the anti-aircraft artillery school. And so I wound up uh, taking my officer's basic in the town of El Paso at Fort uh, Bliss. I completed my officer's basic training and went into a rather long program of gun classes for anti-aircraft artillery. My son, uh, who loves uh, hunting and fishing, envies me, I think. He, he's now engaged in that industry, making uh, 
uh, unique uh, gun parts out in Idaho. But he uh, envies me, I think, perhaps because I got to fire everything from a, a, a 32 caliber um, M1A1 all the way up to a 180 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. And uh, when I finished that class in the graduation ceremony, announcement was made that we would no longer be using any anti-aircraft guns, which was kind of a surprise. They were going to be given to all of our allies. And so we were going to start a new class the following Monday as a missile class. And so I got into one of the pioneer missile classes of the Nike Ajax, right. which was the first missile for anti-aircraft missile of any importance in the United States. I took that class and uh, learned all about missiles. A little, I thought it was kind of ironic that I was a pre-law student and a law student taking missile and gun classes, but in the Army's wisdom, you never know. So, so I finished that class, and on, again, another surprise announcement. On the graduation day of that class, <laughs> they announced that uh, they were looking for anyone who had had any, any legal experience in the graduating class. I, of course, raised my well, hand. it just so happened. I had one year. Right. That's my experience. But I'd done very well my first year, so I felt somewhat confident. And uh, they said, would you please report to the regimental commander's office immediately following this formation? Then the, then, the, then the reality set in. And so I went there and they said, Lieutenant, we'd like you to report it on Monday morning. You are our new post legal advisor. Oh my God. What? Goodness. You know, I, one year of law school and I'm the post. They didn't have a JAG officer there at the time. This is a training camp. And so I went to, to that reporting in, found out my direct supervisor was the regimental commander of the base. Quite a, quite a step from second lieutenant reporting to Bird Colonel. And, but I took it in stride and he showed me my new office. I went into my new office and it was rather an interesting day. There were four people in the office, not counting me. And uh, the first one I met was a sergeant major who had had 26 years in JAG. My first sergeant was also in JAG had 13 years service in JAG, and my two clerk typists were Harvard Law School graduates. I was in charge of that, of, of that group. <laughs> you, Typical you can army. You can, imagine, you can imagine my, uh, my great, great, great expectations. So I, I recovered from the shock and had my first meeting with my staff. And they said, Lieutenant, what would you like us to do? I said, what are you doing now? They said, all the things that are required, which was primarily to establish, as you know, special courts martial, and also to handle all the alibis of people who got back late from Juarez. Mm -hmm. And at, once a year, I had to advise the regimental commander on who should get Christmas clemency to get out of the stockade. Stock Those were basically the three tasks. So I looked at him without smiling and tried to be military-like and said, uh, how are things going? And they said, very well. I said, well, let's keep it that way because I have a saying, never change a winning game. Always change a losing game. Tennis player taught me that once. So, so I, I, I said, if you don't have any objection, we'll continue doing what we're doing until it doesn't work. Well, I was shocked that they all burst out laughing. They said, we get one a, a new person like yourself about every six months or so, and they always come in and want to reorganize. You're the first person that hadn't come in to reorganize. So that's what we did for the rest of my time there, and I was very patting myself on the back because in that whole time, I'd never gotten what you well know, officer of the day, mm -hmm. which meant take care of the whole post all night. And I was down to my next to the last week and all of a sudden I look on the board and I see the list with my name on it. Now, for people who are not familiar with this, it may not seem very strange, but someone who is knows that entails a little responsibility. Right. So you have to inspect all the troops who are on duty that night. And also the part I love most was review them for general orders. General orders being things you memorize. 
I had never heard general orders before, and I have to memorize them to inspect the people who are going to tell me what, what the general orders are. <laughs> so, so I worked all night trying to remember these, and I thought I had them down pretty well. And so I start the inspection, and I go down, and this was a time of a little unrest in the military because uh, the, the military was just becoming integrated. And so we had a, a, a situation where we may have had one or two African Americans in the whole class. No women was, were present at that time, but that was our big, big uh, a sociological adjustment. And so as we go down the line, I happened to come to one of the gentlemen who happened to be from Alabama or Mississippi. And he could, you could tell by his accent. He had that, that, that accent from deep south. And so I asked him for one of the general orders, which had to do with respecting the flag and saluting the flag. And so he was so scared that he got it all mixed up. And instead of saying all colors, meaning flags, not properly encased, he says all colored guards, not properly encased. <laughs> now my, 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 my officer in charge of the, the formation with me happened to be an African-American. And so I, I immediately began to think, does this gentleman next to me think this guy's trying to put something on, or is it generally accepted that he doesn't know what he's doing? So I, 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 didn't, I didn't laugh, I didn't smile, I said, uh, Mr., I think you better practice that one again. I'll be back for another one and moved on. <laughs> and and my, my friend burst out laughing next to me. He says, that was the same thing I was thinking. <laughs> so, so that was my, my night. And that night of all times, if you can imagine, Skip, right. something happened. The stockade was broken into. Oh, my Lord. Not the stockade. <laughs> the, the PX. <laughs> the, not the, the PX, stockade. Yeah. The PX was broken into. And most people don't break into stockades. Yeah. Yes. In case you don't know. So, so I had to fill out 10 tons of papers. It took me another four hours just to fill out all the papers. And that was my one and only experience with officer of the day. Well, I finished that tour of duty and the army decided they were running out of money. My original orders were for two years on active duty. And I think three years in the active reserve, something like that. And uh, they, they, they started a program called RIF. R-I-F, I don't know if you're familiar yes, with that. Yes. Reduction in forces. forces. And so they were trying to cut everybody out. They made uh, uh, reserve colonels, uh, warrant officers, all kinds of things. And, and so they uh, said to me, we're changing your orders. Instead of two years, we're gonna give you six months training and we're changing your reserve training from two or three years to five and a half years. So that was the change I, I had happen there. So I said, well, okay. So I wrote back to the congressman that I worked for and told him I'd like to come back to my work in the House of Representatives early. And he said, what do you mean? I told him. And I found out later they put on my form PI, which means political influence, because I was working for the congressman. And so I went back to Washington and took back my old job after five, uh, six months away and caught up with my original class and graduated with them. By doing this, I went to summer school. Well, while I was in Washington, uh, I was assigned to train the Maryland National Guard on how to fire the new missiles. Well, this I again with thought was kind of funny as a as an attorney training people how to do. It. I was a radar platoon commander, and we had sites all around Baltimore. I guess you remember that. That's right. And I had to go to all the sites. And we converted them from guns to missiles. There was one right outside of Ricerstown. Oh, Ricerstown? And the headquarters was right off York Road right. in Baltimore. The, the, I Fork, Maryland. And later on, we, unbeknownst to the public, we had one, I believe, one site with nuclear warheads, which was at the Bay Bridge. So we had, we had a course in nuclear warfare. And uh, I went down to each of the sites and would have classes. I do, do that weekend warriors, they called it and we'd do Friday, Saturday, and Sunday classes. And as that went on, I, I, I was also shocked to find out I was also reappointed. I would now had a commission in the U.S. Army Reserve, but in order to command National Guard, I also had to be commissioned in the National Guard simultaneously. So I got a commission from the governor, one from the governor, National Guard, one from the president, U.S. Army. 
taught the classes, had a great time with the people there. Everybody told me that I'd never be able to do it because you, you're not going to be able to teach these people in the National Guard how to fire these complicated missiles. Well, one night we were having a training session. That one of the, they asked on the, the uh, questionnaire whether I had any unusual experience. Well, one night we're doing a training mission at Fort Maryland, I believe it was, and all of a sudden, as we're going through the, the routines, I told uh, my, my, my staff there who worked the radar that it was like a, a, a game. They were just starting Pong, the video games yeah, and all right. kinds of things, not at home, but in the galleries. And I said, it's like a game. You just have to put that little dot on that little dot and hold it there. Each one had elevation, azimuth, and range to make the missiles work. The missiles, by the way, were uncanny. We had a trailer about uh, 40 feet long and 10 feet wide full of tubes, no transistors. So the heat built up tremendously and they had to air condition them. It was, the trailers were made of magnesium. Now if anybody knows what magnesium does, it's another name for flash powder in the old cameras mm. where you, you put a match to it and it ignites some almost spontaneously. Well, to get out of those trailers, the only way you could get out possibly before they burned to the ground was they had what they called kick bars and they put a, a four by four panel that you'd reach up and grab the kick bar, repel against the wall, hit it with your feet and go out feet first. So every, for years later, every time I heard a volunteer fire department klaxon go off, it was identical to the warning for the missile site. And they, I'd wake up in a cold sweat thinking, looking for the kick bar. And my wife used to say, what's the matter? I said, don't worry about it. But uh, we had this training, and we, we went back and started checking out the site, and all of a sudden, I began seeing something coming in from us from across the Atlantic Ocean at a speed that, unbelievable, 1,000 miles plus. No planes no, that we knew were flying at that speed, certainly no bombers. And so it kept getting closer and closer, and I began to realize that this is the missile I may have heard about that homes in on a radar signal. It follows your beam back to where you are. And I see that coming in. Now, there was no missile that could stop that that we had. We only got planes, not missiles. And so I called Fort Bean, which was in charge of the whole East Coast. And they, they had a thing there called Missile Master. They told you what targets were coming where. I said, check my scope, there's something coming in that I've never seen anything before. Well, they look at it, they get back on, they say, neither are we. That was reassuring, right? So I said, well, what should I do? They said, stand by. I love that. This is coming in at 1,000 miles an hour plus, and they told me to stand by. Meanwhile, all my troops were saying to me, what should we do, Lieutenant? I said, stand by, <laughs> following orders, right? So we go through this scenario several times. Finally, I get a call from Fort Meade they say, disregard the incoming. Disregard the incoming? Well, yes, we found out what it is. Miracle of miracles. Never can happen before or since. We had a site in Philadelphia that was in perfect sync with our radar beam. And as we turned our radar, their radar was in perfect sync. Their beam was hitting our beam and bouncing back. <laughs> so that was the incoming thousand mile an hour craft. Well, that was a funny incident, but the next one, next thing I remember that was not as funny was uh, when a little incident came along in 1962 as I was getting near the end of my tenure, and that was a thing called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well known. <laughs> you, you kind of remember that. <laughs> yes. I still have some friends, by the way, who think that was a fake. They're the same ones who think we never got to the moon. But yeah. they told me that was all put up job, there was no mm -hmm. Russian missile crisis. So anyway, we, I was uh, finishing law school, and believe it or not, as you probably may recall, I be, had to put on a new hat, a political hat, and ran against the largest political machine in Baltimore City, and was fortunate enough, after a long battle, to get elected to the legislature. Well, this was just after the election, this within weeks, and I looked at my wife and said, I can't tell you where I'm going or what I'm going to do, but you can probably figure it out. But it, it's kind of ironic that we, we, we win this election and, and now we may not get sworn in. 
<laughs> and so I left my wife and my two children in Howard County because I thought they may be outside the, the Baltimore zone, which is crazy, because if, as you probably well know, with your chem, chem, chemical background and nuclear spin-off, that the Russians had, at that time, what we called 100 megaton weapons. Right. 100 megatons is 100 million tons of TNT. So if you, if you fire a missile at Baltimore and it hits anywhere near Philadelphia, it probably still does the job. So they had gone all the way from Boston to Richmond to hit the whole, every target, it's called interdiction. And they came down the, the whole coastline with these explosions. So I said, put my wife and children in Howard County with my sister would make no difference. In fact, you were more likely to get hit in Cumberland than you were in Baltimore because the Russian missiles were very inaccurate. But we had been told that there would be 10,000 Russian planes, which sound like a lot of planes, coming over the North Pole that night into the United States. And, and kind of disconcerting thinking you're in a magnesium trailer that one little spark sets it off. All the missiles, by the way, were in concrete beds, which would have been totally worthless without any radar to guide them. A typical problem. So the, uh, we, we, we finally got the word at the last minute that the Russian fleet had turned around. And you can imagine what happened in that, in that facility. We had the wildest celebration you can ever imagine. So that was probably one of the most unusual nights I've ever spent. And, uh, and luckily, I, I did get sworn in later for, for my elect, new elected post. And uh, that just a, a few months before that, when I finished law school, I was uh, commissioned as a first lieutenant in the uh, JAG Corps and was reassigned from missiles to a facility in Riverdale, Maryland. I don't know if you know, it's over near Laurel. And that was, uh, interestingly enough, a replacement garrison that in case Fort Meade was wiped out by a nuclear attack, that they were going to take over. Made no sense <laughs> to me to have a replacement centered in, in, in Laurel, Maryland, about 20 miles from Fort Meade, that was going to replace them. But I guess they had, had some greater wisdom. So anyway, that was my concluding experience because uh, with my new schedule with the legislature, of course, I was uh, not able to attend the meetings and things that I did. But my, my five and a half years ended in 1963 when I got my uh, discharge. And when I was in the legislature, my next door seatmate turned out to be Ted Warfield, who was then the, uh, the uh, Maryland National Guard commander. And he asked me if I'd like to go into the Air National Guard as a, as a major on the JAG staff. Well, I almost did that one. But my wife talked me, to me and said, I think you better pass on that one. So I didn't take that appointment. Sometimes I wish I had, because I get to fly down to Bermuda on weekends. I did a lot of training flights. But uh, that, was, that was my military career. And I, and I, I made a, a couple of notes down on my, my thing here that the, the thing that I think uh, that gets me the most is that I had four brother-in-laws, no, no, four sisters, none of them were in the military. But three of my brother-in-laws were in the military. One was in at Glenelg Martin's in a national defense position. But the two of them were in the Army. One was in the Marine Corps in 1938. Wow. And he was there with the Dominican Republic right. invasion, as you know. Right. And uh, so my, my younger brother-in-law is still living. He's uh, 88 now. But he was with Patton from the beginning almost shortly after D-Day till the end of the war in Czechoslovakia in the infantry. The amazing thing is people were being killed all around him. He went from a private to a, 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 a staff sergeant in a matter of months, I guess, on that kind of attrition and, and served all the way through. But it, I often uh, think, I don't know if we really appreciate what it was like. I re, you're, you're too young to remember the beginning of World War II, but I still remember no, the day. No, I remember very well. Yeah, I, re I remember the day Pearl Harbor was Yeah, bombed. so do I. And I was in, on, on a streetcar in Baltimore, coming from East Baltimore, Howard Johnson's for dinner, right. where they had 36 flavors or whatever. And I look out the window with my two friends and see headlines that were being head out in the newspaper, Pearl Harbor bomb. I didn't really know where Pearl Harbor was. 
but I saw people in the military looking very upset. And, and I, I think sometimes until we had 9-11, 9-1-1, that many people in the United States today have no idea what that trauma is like when that hits. That's right. uh, you, you see that all the time. Yeah. I still teach a class at the community college. It's my 13th year. I started for one year. But I, it's, I, I tell my students it's kind of interesting because I first taught the class in American government at, at Western Maryland College over 50 years ago. And, and I tell them I was teaching at the same time Lincoln was president. And, and then I wait it. to see if they laugh. Yeah. And if they don't laugh, either I look very old or their history is terrible. Yes. And when, I don't know which, but, right. but I try that all the time, just a little right. test run. But uh, I was the first political science major there. And so now I'm trying to get political science people to, we have a lot of courses on maintaining peace, but people don't realize that the, that the, uh, that the war, this country was founded as a result of a war. And those, those veterans who fought in the revolution are the ones who actually gave this country a chance to get started. Right. And if you look at history and start marking off the wars the country has had, they're very pivotal in what happened to this nation today as it is right at the moment. We don't know how to fight this new one very well. But uh, well, that's, that's, that's where I think, and, and so if, if, with your permission, I, what I do with my students for veterans is do something that when I was in elementary school, what got me, I guess, patriotic, is that every day in the elementary school, every student had to recite the American's Creed. Have you ever, anybody ever heard the American's Creed? No, yes, I, I just thought gonna, of it. We have just a few minutes left. I got you one minute. We're, we're gonna one let minute. you recite it. Yeah, one minute, because this is the one that I think is the Veterans Creed. Right. It's, it's, it was written by a guy in 1918 in a contest sponsored by the United States House of Representatives. And his name was William Tyler Page. He won the contest. I memorized this, and I think I still have it memorized, but I won't take that chance. It says, I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed a democracy in a republic, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, a perfect union, one and inseparable, established upon these principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity, for which American patriots sacrifice their lives and fortunes. I therefore believe it is my duty to my country to love it, to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend it against all enemies. As you probably know, this is part of the oath that everyone in the military takes at the end to defend it against all enemies. I think this, this American creed, I'm getting ready to give it as a, an alternate final exam question to my political science class, teaches the whole history of American government in a very short space. And I, I think to the veterans, like my brother-in-law, who at 18 was fighting life and death battles in Europe, that it's, it's the least we can do. And I hope, I hope uh, the veterans that we have with us today will understand our respect and admiration for them for the work that they did. Well, we certainly do hope that that's true. And we certainly do thank you for your service. Uh, as you know, you may make fun of it and make jokes about it, but it was consequential, and it did help the United States as all the veterans were interviewing. Hey, listen, and we thank you very much for doing that. I appreciate that. So. In fact, uh, my brother-in-law that I mentioned teases me about the, he was in a hot war, I was in a cold war. I said, yeah, but it was the longest war the country ever fought, the cold war. Yes. And, and number two, I, this, I think this is probably unique, which I didn't mention and I'll conclude, that when we were on the missile sites, they told us we were the first American military unit on continental United States since the Civil War. We got green chevrons. I don't know if you know what those mean, but they were combat positions, the first combat positions on U.S. soil since the Civil War, which I thought was also very unique.